Hi, I'm Linda Sterling. Um, as Ben said, I just opened a practice in Overland Park, Sterling Sport Mindset. Um, the last 12 years, I was a professor at Northwest Missouri State. Um, I started their master's program in sport and exercise psych, but since I um, decided to go out on my own and um, actually apply the things I've been teaching for the last 12 years. Um, my sport background is actually softball. Um, I played in college, but my kids play soccer, and so I'm pretty into it now. Then. Um, but I work with athletes on the mental side of the game, um, working on the confidence, concentration, composure, how to balance back when things aren't going right, um, if you're injured. Uh, we work on those things. Bringing your best performance to every performance. It doesn't have to be when things are going um, wrong. It could be things are going great and you want them to keep going great consistently. Um, in my um, office, and I have a couple of people who work with me too, our focus is on, on and off the, the field. Um, so we want you to be good in life as well as in sport. And I'm the EDA support. I, uh... I came to Kansas City eight years ago to play for Kansas City Commons. I uh, went to University of Detroit, majored uh, criminal justice and minor in addiction studies. When I graduated there, I got drafted. I played four years professionally for the Detroit Ignition. The contract was up, then I had offers to Baltimore, Milwaukee, and Kansas City. As a lot of you know, Kansas City was coming back. Uh, around four of my teammates from Detroit, we decided to come to Kansas City because uh, it would be a new franchise again and Baltimore and Milwaukee are very established franchises, so we kind of wanted to put a footprint in the city. We did very well. I uh, retired last season, and um, when I moved here, a lot of clubs wanted to meet a coach, you know, coach here, coach there. I started doing individual training, and I started with one kid, and I was just in a park, actually at a 119th in Quivira. Uh, I think it's Tom Stone Memorial Park. That's where I did my first individual, and then, uh, the business grew and it grew and grew and now we have two locations, one in Kansas and one in Missouri. And all we focus on is the technical part of the game, technical, technical, technical work. I really feel during the practice session a coach doesn't have an hour and a half to spend on technical because then he's uh, neglecting the ta tactical part of the game, you know. There's so many aspects, so we kind of hone in all on technical work. And uh, of course, like we all know, this is just a game and there's bigger messages than just technical part is to work at it. Don't give up. So we try to really drive those principles into the players we train. Scott Moody, uh, have been doing this in Kansas City since, uh, well, for the last 20 years. Started at uh, the Shawnee Mission Medical Center. They gave me a stairway and a small little office downstairs in their sports care department. And we grew from two or three athletes coming back from injuries and returning to sport to you know what we have now, where we're located in, uh, in right inside this building, and have some of the fields that we use out here. Our our message, our philosophy, is kind of integrating the the skills of the sport with the the physical skills with the technical skills um, to kind of elevate the confidence and competitiveness of the the athletes that we train. And so, what I mean by that is we we look at the skills of soccer and we look at the physical requirements to execute that skill at a high level. And then what we do is we kind of blend the physical attributes of, of agility, footwork, uh, quickness, uh, strength, power, you know, things like that into those skills um, in a kind of combined session. It's, it's a fun way to kind of drive that message home to the athlete as they're you know, doing agility, but there's a ball there. And now they can move like they would normally move on the field. So that integrated approach between skill and speed um, to kind of drive home that confident uh, competitive. That's kind of what we do. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, I, I want to start off by talking a little bit about actually not doing any kind of work, but like the author, I know there's a lot of um, talk about overuse injuries, and like I kind of want to start off talking about rest a little bit in the off season. Like in, in terms of your experiences, um, I guess I guess the, what maybe kind of the question I was we were kind of wondering about was. Um, like, what's kind of maybe like the minimum amount of time you would suggest like an athlete, like a student athlete, like you know, maybe, uh, take a break in the summer? And then the other kind of the second part of that was how 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 easy to be successful. Maybe like kids that kind of work the season ends, they kind of keep working hard and then take a break later on, or is it better to kind of take a break right away 
can just um, recuperate and then maybe kind of get back into it before the season starts. In my opinion, you should take a break right away. Um, you don't want to be taking a break right before the season. It, it doesn't work as well, in my experience. Um, and I, I think there's different types of breaks. There's a, there's a shutdown break where you just shut down completely and you just go rest. Um, that might be good if you've had a if you've battled you know injuries, soreness, you know just uh, mental fatigue. But there's also a mental break. There's uh, you know where you just get out of the tactical environment and you get into more of an individualized training environment. That can be extremely beneficial, and it, you don't need to take the summer off. Um, because that different type of focus on myself versus focus on my team can you know, change the way you do that. Yeah, I, I agree. Taking a break right after season, I think, is uh, very, very important. But it also depends on what level we're talking about. Because if we're talking about uh, a Division Five, you know, um, boys or girls team, uh, they don't really need a break. And it also depends, uh, are they doing multiple sports, you know? Um, now, if we're talking about DA, even DA, I mean, they practice four times a week, and the games, it's not a heavy game schedule um, to say, hey, we need a break. You know, now if we go to the college level, I can understand after the season, let's take a break. Myself, personally, from my experience, I would take a week, week and a half off. Uh, usually go on vacation, actually, you know, get away. Um, like Scott said, the mental part of it, just, it, it's draining, you know, when the you got to perform, you got to perform. And, uh, but that's, it uh, kind of depends on what level you're talking about to kind of answer the question on the break. I think you've made good points about the, um, the mental break and the burnout. Sometimes you, when you start to see signs of that, that just the, and the overuse sometimes, the, the, the fatigue and the not feeling the love of the game at that point, that, that you're probably gonna wanna have that break. I think the length of the break I would defer to you guys on that stuff, but some athletes are going to want it more than others. And the idea of a vacation or that whole just getting away from it for a little while is is a good thing. Um, I was going to go somewhere else with that too. I I'll, but yeah, go ahead. I'll, ju I'll jump in on that. And I think that as coaches, a lot of times we see the fatigue, we see the um, disinterest, we see some of the lack of motivation and we think overtraining, you know, they need a break. Um, when it's too much team focused and I have to be here and it's scheduled and it's every day that we see this with the DA, sometimes it gets, it's a little bit more mental fatigue, but as soon as the season is over and they switch to more of a, now I can focus on myself, they want to run, they want to do stuff, they want to go lift, they want to go exit, they, they want to go kick a ball, they want to focus on the individual aspects. Um, and they super motivated instantly within a week. Um, so I think it's more of a just a scheduling, mental, school, everything, stress, fatigue, versus a pure physical right. fatigue at this level. I think it's that time for a break, like you said, to focus on something new and then just to return to that level of the game. Yeah. So you kind of know when they're ready to start playing when they're like, hey, as as they'll, they'll want, they'll, you'll know when they're ready. They're like, hey, I want to go play, I want to kick, or what can I go? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've got a couple players that have been called up the national team. They come in here and they're mentally just, they, they don't want to go practice. They don't want to do anything. They don't want to do anything. But then as soon as they get back, they're like, hey, can I set up a session with you? I want to work on this. I want to work on that. Because they want to focus on themselves. So I don't think it's necessarily as physical as we might perceive it. I think it's more yeah. just emotion. Is there, are, have you guys found any good um, in terms of, if a kid wants to start, if an athlete wants to stay active, but they maybe are, they, they, but want to actually take a little bit of a break, is there other good than cross training kind of things you suggest in the summer? Uh, I think uh, swimming, you know, lay off the joints, you know, very, very good for cardio. Um, soccer tennis, soccer tennis is great. Uh, in Europe, a lot of a lot of teams do ping pong. You know, ping pong for cross training because the footwork, tennis, uh, what's that? Pickleball. Yeah, 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 that's right. Love it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, those are good. Just get away from the ball. You know, stuff that's, uh, you're working on quick footwork or like swimming, but you're off of the ball. And this is, um, 
This is if you want to get into it right away, right after. You don't want to take too much of a break, but you need to stay. Fitness is so, I mean, Scott can tell you, so hard to get, but you can lose in a week. You know, so as much as you want to say break, you got to be cautious with the break you do as well. So a little bit of swimming in there, a little, a sweat with a jog 20 minutes a day, 25 minutes a day, a steady pace, can, uh, can give you a break, but still keep your cardio a little bit high, you know? And the, the one thing about fitness that I don't think a lot of people really understand is the the benefit of the slow aerobic work, like the swims, the, the bites, the steady state. Because when you're talking about training the heart for that type of thing, you're, you're really just looking for that, that smooth aerobic base. What's that going to gain? That's going to allow them to last longer in a session. It's going to allow them to recover quicker from a session. It's going to allow, allow them to recover quicker between exercises between sets and small sided games, they'll recover faster and be able to get more out of everything. The problem is, especially with females, um, they want to go too hard and they get they get outside of that steady aerobic zone so they don't develop that base. They have the ability to train at a really high level but they fatigue too quick. That accumulated fatigue over time just kind of carries over. So the, the smooth, steady aerobic work, especially in the early off season, um, is so critical but so hard to get them to understand how beneficial it is. Does anybody have any questions? Or, um, I was going to move on a little bit to um, kind of along the lines of what you said, the mental fatigue, but like kind of some kind of reflections, like after the season's over, reflecting on like the highs and the lows of the season, um, thinking about what's coming up next season, like with their team change in the conference, different age group. Um, and I was going to ask, I don't know if you guys had any like the resources for helping um, players kind of do that kind of reflection and get ready for the next season. Yeah, you know what, I, I'm a firm believer and I don't think it happens enough, uh, is game tape. Uh, game tape is a great way to reflect on yourself. It's because when you're, in, when you're doing something that's, it's not wrong, but it's not the right thing on the field, it's not that you're doing it on purpose, it's a habit. And uh, when it's a habit, you don't realize it. But if you sometimes, and this, I might be biased because this is good for me, but when I'm still in game tape, I'm like, wow, I can't believe I'm not doing that. But during the game, I don't even realize that I was just doing that. Like, um, the guy has the ball and I should create an angle, and over and over and over time, I kept myself, well, uh, I can't create that angle. But you see it on tape, and you're like, I should have made that run. I should have made that run. And the next time that happens in the game, you're like, okay, I saw it, I see my flaw. Hopefully you can identify it and you go. So I think game tape is so, so important. But it's not just watching. It's watching and then when the right time's there, it's for someone to pause it and show you. Because again, if it's a habit to do the wrong thing when you're watching, it's a habit not to catch it. You know, so you have to be informed on how, what it is. But uh, game tape is very important. It's interesting. So you have to, even if you don't watch it during the season, if you just save it, and then the off season you can pull it up Look at it. Ideally, you would watch it during season, but if right. you don't, it can help out a lot. Yeah. So, how would you, let's say, for a player who has all this tape, but like, if they don't have the, if they don't have the person around them, like their parent, like, to give them that feedback, like, what is there any good resources for that? Or uh, that's a good question. It's time, it's time intensive, right? It's, right. It's not like. I mean, I have some uh, some of my parents from, uh, there's a huddle, there's a program, yeah. they'll send it. I've sat down with some of my players and said, hey, I watched the game, make my notes. But like you said, it's very time intensive. And if parents ask me, I'll do it. But it's, uh, it's tough because the person that's sitting there doing videotape has to know what they're doing. Yeah. Well, there are programs like the Observer, I don't know if you guys have seen that one, where they'll you can upload all of your tapes, all of your games to it, and then they actually their software does stuff. And so maybe like if, if, a, if a person is taking video and upload it somewhere, then they can probably find a resource for someone to, to analyze it. Or, so actually, I think they actually do an analysis of the you. Yeah, I think Huddle does like, I've seen a parent show me possession, uh, passes connected, like it's pretty intensive what they do. But uh, those are just stats. You know, at the end of the day, you really need someone to sit there and show you and you, you need to not watch the good that's but also watch the bad that's right and and then to go out and practice come up with drills come up with ways to work and improve on the 
those things, not just realize you're doing it and think it'll fix itself. Yeah. But, and, and that's one of the best ways to use, like to do visual imagery and to learn how to do visual imagery is watch the tapes like that are good, watch them, loop them, and then close your eyes and do it in your head so you can practice doing visual imagery with them. Um, not to not to change the topic, but um, one thing we're talking about like negative things or things that they don't do well. One of the things that I'll ask the players to do is make a list of all the things that you consider weaknesses and all the things that you consider strengths. And then throughout the off season or a time of development, um, I want them to focus on their strengths and making it not only being good at something, but being the best at that. Because that's probably what they're genetically or um, mentally or physically a little bit more capable of being great at. If we just focus on the weaknesses, you might be good, but you're never going to be great. So um, I like them to kind of steer into that. And then you just want to bring those weaknesses up to levels where they're not um, glaring weaknesses, um, where you're adequate. But, you know. Might be great. We do that with goal setting too, and because the goal setting from confidence or from a strengths-based approach from abundance, so you're going to want to be in that place where you're feeling good about things when you set those goals. So that it goes along with that. Yeah, and I've had a lot of players show me their evaluations from coaches, and it was, you need to be better at this, 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 this. And so it's all these weaknesses, so that's what they think they need to focus on. But what about the two or three things that they were pretty good at, but have the, the, the potential to be extremely great at? What if we just kind of shifted our mindset over to those things and made sure that the weaknesses weren't hurting the team, but um, focus on being great? So that was actually the next thing I was, the, the goals was the next thing we were talking about in the next level. One of my questions that I had that I didn't include was, should they work on their, improving their strengths or, or amplifying their strengths or improving their weaknesses? So, so the, the biggest success you've seen is identifying where you're, like, like so I guess that kind of goes back to, that also comes to the age too, right? It's somewhat like if you know like you're, like you're a nine, you want to, like you want to work on finishing or something like that. But if you're the younger, is it harder to do the younger? Well, it's, it's more along the lines of a coach telling a player you need to be faster. Um, okay, we all know a fast kid when we see a fast kid. And that kid was not taught to be fast. Okay, that kid was just fast. And they're slow kids. And those kids are never going to be as fast as that fast kid, no matter what they do. Um, if you're only focused on trying to be something that you're never going to be able to be great at, that's that's what I'm saying. Is okay now. I can make you quicker. Okay, we can reposition our feet faster. We can think better. You can you can talk technical, right. and you can get them out of situations where their speed becomes exposed. Okay, so that they read the game a little faster. But I'm never if I'm just focused on this weakness that is never going to be as good as everybody wants it to be. You're going to burn out, struggle, and be frustrated and we miss an opportunity to work something that could have made you great. Right. They say uh, to be a professional athlete for soccer, you have to do one thing, the best in the world, yes. that come and how he hits the ball, or you have to do everything. Yeah. Those are the two things, right? And uh, I, I think uh, going back to the fun, I think in that you focus on your fundamentals, fundamentals, and you have to hone in on what you're good at. Because if it's speed with the ball, then gosh, I want my outside midfielder taking guys on every time, you know? And uh, him not being so worried on having the greatest touch. Because we know guys that are fast aren't going to have a touch like Messi. You know what I mean? So we got to uh, focus on what the guy's strength is, and like Scott said, and hone in on that. But at the same time, don't neglect and try to improve your weaknesses. So kind of figuring out who they are as a player, like kind of like the player personality is, like what they're, the, the, like they're the best at, what they have the most potential to be. Yes. Like focusing on that, and like if there's things they're not they're terrible at, getting those up a little bit, but really putting most of the effort on it. Bring your weaknesses up to adequate levels to where you're not hurting the team with your weakness, but then whatever your strength might be, let's, let's really hone in on that and embrace that, because that's what you have the potential to be an impact. Have you seen a lot of 
success with that over, I mean, over the years? Mental and physical. It, it's because if they're pretty good at it already, they probably won't mind focusing on it, so they'll focus on a little bit more. But if it's fitness, for example, is a weakness of theirs, telling them to run and they don't feel like running is probably not going to get it. But if I can say, you're fast, let's do this repeated sprint work, and if you're pretty good with the ball, let's do it with the ball, I'm going to get my fitness out of that because they're going to work harder within that drill. So taking a strength and being able to develop a weakness. Can, Linda, can you talk about the motivation involved in doing something you enjoy doing as opposed to the for sure. Try to do something you yeah. don't want to do. Right, and that's what I was just thinking is the confidence that's built with that. And when we're feeling confident about something, we're usually more motivated. Um, motivation is that fire that comes from within, right? We try to motivate athletes, but really we can't. They have to motivate themselves, but we can set up an environment that feels more motivational to them, and that's what you're talking about there is, yeah, building that so they kind of don't know that they're working on some of the stuff that they want to, so, yeah. So what kind of steps do you take when a uh, student athlete or athlete comes to you? Uh, what are like the initial steps to like get him, him or her in the right direction? For motivation? Well, this is like in general. So motivation or well, mainly motivation, I think, first step. Okay. So we'll look at the thoughts behind things. Usually, so thoughts um, lead to feelings, to actions, to results kind of the philosophy we use. So we're going to see what thoughts are happening. And if it's like, I'm not good at this, and this is all I have to focus on, then they're going to start to feel down about that. Um, the actions, they're not going to want to do it. I don't want to go to practice. I don't want to work on you know, speed work or whatever it is. And then the result always proves that original thought. It's like, I'm not good at that. Um, so we work on changing those thoughts. Because we actually all get to choose our thoughts, whether we realize it or not. And it takes some work to figure that out, but we can't automatically go from I'm, you know, I'm great at this, um, or from feeling like they're a failure or something to I'm great at this. Sometimes we have to do a transition thought, like a bridge thought. So um, we don't go from I'm a failure to I'm a record breaker, then we might go to I'm an athlete in between. So just something that feels a step better is sometimes where we go when the thoughts are really fairly negative. Um, what other things did you um, Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to get the, the, the mental part and the physical, I mean, mental drives the physical, so it's, it's, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to remember that, or easy to forget when you're a coach, because you can't see inside the little heads. <laughs> so, um, in terms of we're talking about you know setting goals for improving over the season. Um, we're talking about maybe focusing on the strengths. How many is, like do you basically just pick one thing, or I mean you actually have to pick a summer. So it, it seems like you wouldn't want to try and say, well, I'm going to get better at these like five things, or maybe you do. Or what's been your experience? Do you try and focus on like a one main thing, or are they write down their strengths, their goals? Hey. Uh, I think you need to focus on a little bit of everything and add some variety to it. You can't just focus on one thing. Um, but um, you need to have that, that one primary driving force, okay? uh, that overall direction that you're headed, uh, what you want to be, that image that you want to have of yourself, what do I want to be on the first day of practice. But um, I think if, if you've had too many focus points, you kind of lose your direction. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to think about what I did in the offseason, and I, uh, I liked focusing on what I was good at. You know, I didn't love doing what I wasn't good at. You know, I'm just trying to think about it. And my, my bread and butter is my technical. So I love playing soccer tennis. I love being on the ball and doing drills. I didn't love going on 45-minute jogs. I mean, my fitness was good. Could it have got better? Yes, it could have. You know, I didn't love doing interval on the uh, sprints, on the treadmill, you know, on and on. I did them, but I didn't love doing them. Uh, and I think I became better, as Scott said it earlier, is because I really focused on what I loved. But I didn't neglect the, the fitness part of it. We, we talk about this concept of economical, so the, the, the physical, the technical, the psychological, and the tactical, all sort of try, you try to combine them in every activity. I think that's what that's a, a current, a, a consistent theme from all of you, that they're not iso an isolated technical or an isolated physical 
but actually it's psychological, they're all in there somewhere. But they're all at different levels throughout that focus. And if, if you've got a team that's not very fit, but extremely technical, can control things, well, we can, we can use that technical drill to start to elevate that fitness. If they think really well, we can have a high focus on tactical and start to elevate those other areas. Summer is actually the best time to develop the mental side of the game, too, because you have time to focus on that. Um, that's when we recommend implementing like a mental skills training. You're going to do that with your team. Um, because we want it to be as automatic as your technical skills and your physical skills. Um, you don't want to have to stop and think, what's my routine for before penalty kick? Like, that's going to be automatic. If you're working on that over the summer, you've got your routine. Um, you know what it's going to be just as automatic as some of your technical your technical skills. Often we don't feel like we have time to work on that during the season, um, so this is a good time to focus on that. Well, it's actually interesting because that, that was one of the questions that was like, probably a good time talking about it was, um, well, actually, it's something else that you said, Scott, was like the, the mental part of it. Like, you, I think you said refer to like how I want the player I want to be the first day of practice. So, like, what about summertime and like visualizations and like uh, mental? Um, what was the word you use? Mental. Um, or, 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 can you talk a little more about over the summer? Like maybe like a kind of visual. Like once you have your goals set up, like what kind of visualizations to people can you work on, or what kind of tools can you use to um, or, or create those routines you talked about? Imagery is really important. Imagery and visualization, same same thing. Um, we I like how you said that. What I want to be at the beginning of the season. So often we'll do our visualization best based on a best performance mentioned that earlier, um, that you recreate that. Most of us can remember our best match or game or whatever. Can you think of it now? Like when you were, see some of you? Yeah, yeah. I can remember, you can smell it, you know what uniform you had on, you know all of the things. Um, but we use that to remember that feeling of what it felt like to do things well. Um, when you do a visualization, you keep it positive and present tense, and you try to include all of the senses that you can. Um, there's a book called The Mental Athlete by Kay Porter, and it has actual visualizations for each sport. There's a soccer one in there. Um, but we like to have athletes write their own. It's a good, um, good skill to get in um, everything they're doing right in the game. So all the technical, thing, te technical things they've learned, um, they feel the power and the speed. We include all that in the visualization. Um, and they take themselves through the key moments of the, of the match. Um, that comes easy to some athletes, and the other athletes' visualiz visualization is really tough. Um, so we will start even basic, like we'll have them close their eyes, imagine a beige wall, imagine you know throwing a red ball against the beige wall, just so you can start to pick up all of those things. Um, so there's you can train your mind for visualization if it doesn't come easy to your athletes. Um, other things when you're working on, maybe you don't have a video of your season. Um, if you see it from this external view, like you're watching a video, that can help cor um, correct your technical uh, errors and things too. Obviously, it's good to have guidance of a coach when you're doing that. Um, but then there's the, the internal kind of visualization where you're seeing yourself like you would see it from your view on the field, um, and that helps when you're when you're training. So Linda, can I follow up mm -hmm. a question? So the guys are really clear on the sport specific, mm -hmm. obviously for V and, and Scott talked about making sure the movement relates to the sport. Mm -hmm. Is there, when you're working with athletes, do you have sport specific type challenges or issues to deal with? Or is it more team sport, individual sport? I mean, is there a soccer mindset that's different than the football mindset or the baseball mindset? You know, it usually goes back to the same core skills, the, the confidence, the composure, the concentration. Um, I haven't seen certain things that, that um, like... So, so yeah, what I about team that. individual? Is a golfer, a swimmer, maybe, maybe why different than a team sport? Yeah, um, it's different because you, often you feel like you're in control of everything in an individual um, sport that it's on you. Um, yeah, there are other factors to consider the team dynamics, especially in soccer, um, where it depends on if other people are where they need to be, and the, the speed and position, and all of those things. So, yeah, there's more of that uh, team cohesion. We talk about that and the relationship factors and 
how you control what you can control and not what other players do. Um, yeah, that's a bigger part of a team sport for sure. Uh, yeah, I'll piggyback off that, and I hate to keep going to myself, but I just thinking about uh, you bring up a great point because with a team, you uh, you have to put the team first in order to be successful. If a uh, successful team, not successful player, if you don't put the team first, it's hard. Now it's tough because humans are greedy, and what do we always do for ourselves first? Uh, but if you can put the team first in a team setting when it comes to your mentality, it will help. Now, individual sports, uh, you don't put anyone but yourself first. Um, so I think that's kind of a little bit different. But I can't tell you guys how many times I've, and, uh, I've visualized, and I'll get personal, I'm getting ready before to go to the stadium, and I'm showering, and I'm visualizing what I want to do in the game, and I do it, you know? And sometimes I forget, because when you win, everyone's happy. You don't think why that happened. And then I go back and I break down my week, and I, I wish I did this earlier in my career, but as I got older, of course you get wiser. So I started going and I said, well, why did that happen? And I thought about, crap, I thought about doing that in the shower. And I can't tell you guys how many times I've done that, and if it's happened over and over and over. Things don't just happen to happen. There is a process that you got to go to your subconscious mind and and try to find it. And uh, sometimes you can't, you know. But a lot of times I've scored my goals, guys. I'm telling you, I visualized them, and uh, it's come out, you know. Now sometimes I visualize and it didn't happen, but uh, I always look at what could we have done better or why the why, you know. And I don't think that's uh, focused enough. Um, I think it's just bypassed. When they lose, there's anger. When there's win, there's happy, but there's no critiquing. You know, so I think for constant growth, you kind of have to, and I'm going off topic, but you've got to constantly analyze, analyze, analyze. No. To, to get this back also, I'm not a visualization expert, but I, I fully support it. Um, one thing that we used, uh, an exercise that we used, is start with the end uh, and say what I said. Um, if you're talking to a player and you, right before the off season, ask them, what do you want me to say to you after our first practice? You know, if, as we're walking off the field, what do you want me to say to you? And they'll know. They'll, they'll be like, I want you to talk about my touch. I want you to talk about how powerful I look or how fast I look. And they'll, they'll know what they want you to say. And then say, okay, what do you need to do to get there? Okay, what, what do you need to do to get to that level? And now they start planning, okay, I've got to be able to do this and this and this. And that becomes the steps. That becomes what they want to focus on in the offseason. So each player will have a different answer to that, and probably it's going to come back to what you as coaches have, have already told them, I need you to do this, I need you to do more of this. And they want to hear, you did it, great job, you know, you put in the work. And it's that's a just... a way to empower them. Yes. I love that. And so that's, that's an exercise that we use with some of the players we work with. You know, a cool story in that is Tom Mira. He told a story about how at the end of every season, parents and kids come to him and say, what, what can I do? I want to be on the top team, what can I do? And he tells, he'll say, I'll do this, this, this. And he's like, I don't remember the statistics, but like he said, hardly ever do they actually do it. And he had this one girl who said, what do I need to do? He's like, you need to work on your first touch to make the top team. And he told a story about like, the next season, like maybe the first day, he was, they were working on first touch, and he like, he wanted to have it show an example of bad first touch. So he like, drilled the ball at her, and she just like, settled it. And he's like, oh, weird. So we did it again, he did it like three times in a row. And she just handled it like a boss. And he was like, she made a top team. But I think it's a good example, as coaches, you can tell players, a lot of people ask, how can I get better? But they don't do it. And that's a, some examples, like like concrete examples of, you know, this is the one thing she need to get better at. And then she went, she worked on it all summer. And then she, and then the coach was impressed because she did it and she was better and she made a top team. So I think it helps to get the stories but like you said, you're making an individual story, like how, what's your story? And it gives them, and it provides their motivation, like you said, this is them, they have a reason to do it. They want to be good at whatever that is. So is most of this really for the kids who are, who are like middle school, high school age? Uh, that sounds like a talk because I can, I can remember, you know, in the backyard, dad teaching me to hit a wiffle ball, and we were in an old two-story house. I said, you know what? 
I'm going to hit. I'm going to hit this ball over the house. And you know what? I don't know. I was probably six or seven years old, hitting a wiffle ball up high. Well, to this day, many, many, many years later, playing the old senior softball, a lot of the home runs I hit are like over the big <laughs> two-story house. And I, and, and I tell you, I can. I I remember one time when I said, "How can I hit the ball better?" And I remember watching Mark McGuire, the years ahead, I said, well, he made that look so easy on a swing. I said, before the next game, I said, you know, I'm going to picture Mark McGuire swinging, and I'm telling you, the first pitch just seemed like it was Mark McGuire hitting the ball, you know, 350 feet. And it's kind of like, I, I see that about, you know, with the kids, about, you know, when, you know, you're talking about making dreams. So anyway, that was just, I was throwing that in because that makes it. Perfectly said. Did you do steroids as well? <laughs> well, you know what? I would say someone accused me. He said, "I want to check your back." And he said, "Because then, you know, I can find when I was doing that. I was a, I was a little skinny kid that weighed maybe 119 out of high school, you know. But then I had bat speed because I played table tennis. I rode a bike, you know, every day. So I that multiple sport thing. But it was also that you know, the whole mental thing, saying, you know, I, I think I can do this. So my question really was, in terms of like uh, off season, is high school soccer versus club soccer is one an off season or not off season? Because I, I and I get because you know where I'm, you know exactly where I'm going with this because I've heard it both sides where you know you, you know you have club coach says oh they just went through high school season it's like I have to start over or. Oh, I got to high school, and oh my God, I was burned out because all we do is train every day for two to three hours, and, and I'm, I'm kind of burned out. So I'm trying to figure out how you handle that kind of off season. Uh, we have a high school coach here, so I'm yeah. be careful with what I said. No, I'm, I'm, I'm on both sides, so you can. Talk I'm, about I'm, I'm joking. No, you're going to talk on both sides. Okay, go ahead. I, uh, I, you know what I think, and that's a great question. I think we got to look at the end result of the player. Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing wrong with being coached by a science teacher in high school and playing Division Three soccer. Right. There's nothing wrong. We got to look at what the end result of that athlete is. Now, if that athlete wants to play uh, top 25 Division One, you know, go for, get uh, drafted to the MLS. Or I don't think there's time during development to be coached by someone that doesn't know soccer. So, uh, and we know there's, so, out of all, all of the players we see, there's such a minimal, minimal amount of players that are gonna get there to the top. So we can't uh, put everyone in one pot, we gotta see what the goal is of that athlete, you know? And that's how we break it down, because if that goal is to get to a high level, there's no time at 15 to be coached by a high school coach that doesn't know anything and is just there to make an extra paycheck because he's the math teacher. Right? There's no time for that, you're just going to interfere with development. But if that kid is just there to work hard, socialize with her girlfriends, uh, come out on the weekend so she can look back at her youth and say, hey, we had a good time at that tournament and we were in the Radisson and we went to the water park. There's a level for everyone, you know? And that's the way I would answer that question. Is that? Is that yeah, no, I just, because uh, I think about, you know, we're trying to have that, that rest and recuperation I mean, trust me, I, my youngest son, who was yesterday, turned 29. By the time he was a senior in high school, and he went to a Kansas City school, he was done playing soccer. He was done. And you know what? He was actually pretty good at what he did. His high school team only had a couple of kids that were playing club. But guess what? Now, as a 29-year-old, he goes out still for fun to play sports and do other things. So. In a, in, a, in a crazy way, he wanted to go learn to play guitar when he was like 17 versus go to soccer. And, and you know what? I'm proud of him that he decided to do it. So it occurs to me that, and, um, to your point, there are athletes that have ultimately, that I wouldn't say their goal was modest, but their end result is going to be recreational soccer as a, as a college kid, um, not on a club team as opposed to a varsity team. Um, so when, when parents bring their kids to you, there must be occasion, I'm sure, I think you'll kind of know the answer, but maybe you can talk about how you deal with it. The parent has an unrealistic expectation. So the athlete, in your estimation, will never be on MLS or NWSL. They're not going to be an elite physical athlete. They're maybe not psychologically prone to playing under high, you know, rigorous competitive environments. 
do you get into that parent management piece too? Because sometimes, in my experience, it makes the kid is realistic and it's the, you're, it's the, the sponsoring adult is less realistic. I'll let you take okay. I, I, I'm very honest with them, and you're totally right. It's usually the parent, you know? And uh, actually, it's so sad to say, but some of the kids come to me, um, some of them, very minimal, don't want to be there. It's mom and dad uh, that brings them, you know? And uh, some parents tell me that their kid's gonna be a D1 athlete, you know? And I have to tell them, I said, hey, I hate to say this, and you never know what a seven-year-old's gonna be when they're 15, right? But when the kid's older and you see certain physical ability that they just don't have, or technical ability, because if you, it's like speaking languages. When you, if it's late, it's easy, you can get it, but it's hard. Uh, same with like touch, if it's 15, 16, and you don't have a touch, and you're telling me you want to play at these, I have to tell the parents, and s some of them uh, respect it, and some of them don't like to hear it, you know? And, uh, but at the end of the day, that kid, that, uh, that parent has an unrealistic goal, is usually forced there by mom and dad. And it's tough, you know, because you're popping the parent's bubble, you know what I mean? Um, it's, it's hard. Um, the, I've worked with over 10,000 athletes in this area over the last 20 years, and about five years ago, I finally started saying to the parent, um, some kids are just better athletes than others, and there's nothing you can do about it. And when you start to look only at the physical traits, like you said, um, I'm not going to be as fast as you say, well, I'm not going to be as fast as this other kid. Um, however, there's a mental part of the game, there's a technical part of the game, there's a tactical part of the game. I might be brilliant at those. If I can just hide my weaknesses and expose and enhance my strengths, then I might have a shot, you know, at, at being somebody. Now, how high a level? Maybe not MLS, maybe. But I can achieve some of my goals, I just need to be realistic. You know what would be cool? Maybe this exists. I, I think someone was talking about, like, was it Fabregas or somebody who's like super, there's some other players who aren't fast, like physically fast, but they're. So it would be cool if there was a list of like professional players and had like their really big weaknesses. Like you don't even notice. You know, like so you could show it to a kid, hey, you know, you're not going to be like, um, you're not going to be uh, like Ibrahimovic, but maybe you'll be this guy who isn't fast, he's not strong, but he's good at these things. Uh, it would be cool if there was a resource where you could give them an example of players who have different strengths and weaknesses and how they. Accentuated those strengths and hit, hit those weaknesses. But one of the things that we haven't really talked about, we talk uh, is, is uh, like execution. So one of the some of the questions we had sent out were about like structure and schedule. Um, so I won't go through all of it. Is there a like? Um, we're running out of time, but in terms of like putting together like like the kind of like a schedule or you know working together. The, but like we talked kind of a little bit about the fitness and the technical together. But in terms of like, well, I guess two questions. One is, as, as a player, um, how do they figure out whether they should train on their own, like with the, with a partner or with the, with the trainer? And then also, I guess the follow-up to that is like, what's, what are some good tips for like establishing like a schedule structure that you guys have found successful? Everybody's different. <laughs> Every situation is different. There's I think at the end of the day in the offseason, we're playing soccer, so I think uh, strength and conditioning is important. I think uh, short sprints are important. I think, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we have to focus on the ball, you know, and uh, uh, I have a little, like just, in a, and again, it depends on the level of the athlete, so that's tough, right? But I'm just talking, uh, not your less than 1% that make it, you know? I would try to go daily, daily on the ball for five to nine year olds, uh, 15 minutes. Daily, just on the ball. Uh, in the off season, you know, and that's minimal. I mean, if you can bump that to 30 minutes, that would be great, you know. Uh, 10 to 12 year olds, if you can go 20 to 25 minutes. Again, these are the athletes that aren't going to uh, division one top 10 programs or professional, you know, this is just someone that's playing the sport, and I think that's who we're kind of focusing on. And then if you're uh, 13 plus, I would go 30 to 35 minutes daily. With that said, you should still do strength work. You should still do uh, 
cardio workouts, you know, maybe sometimes do your interval sprints, your gym, your gym, of course your gym, but uh, swimming. But uh, uh, I would love to see every kid on the ball daily during the off season. And when you say that, are you talking about like, maybe like doing like technical drills, or, or, or what about they just go out and play like 3v3? Is that kind of the same kind of thing, or uh, both? I mean, obviously the more the better. But. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you can do 3v3 and you can get six guys together, that's unbelievable because there's no training session any coach can mimic that will give you a game situation. It's impossible. Um, so doing cone work all alone is great. You're working on your touch, but if you don't know where to be or how to use that first touch, it also becomes useless. You know. So I think a kind of a mixture of both. I that if you sorry, sorry if you promote routine, if, if somewhere there's a kind of a protocol you go through, when do you start talking to the athlete about that in, you, in your process, and when do you suggest to them that there's a step to preparation? The beginning is we talk about routines and how important they are. Um, whether it's a routine that you do every day for your training, whether or whether it's a routine you do before the, the match. Um, when we do routines, we do three steps. So they need to have something physical, something um, auditory that they say to themselves, or um, and something visual. So maybe before. The so this process of in the shower is a physical trigger, right? The right. Yeah, it could be. And then we want something that they're going to have at every competition, too. So, and we talk about a green and gold zone. So there's this time. The green zone is like everything leading up to the the match, the competition, the game. Um, and that's you know your warm up, um, maybe talking to your parents or you know chatting with teammates about the week. And then we go into the gold zone where it's game on, right? You have to be ready um, and having a transition there, a routine. So um, whether it's something you do, like maybe you're going to wipe your hands on your shorts and you're going to look at the back of the net and you're going to say whatever go-to phrase, we like to have a keyword or a go-to phrase. And that is that transition, like I'm ready, like I'm ready for her. And you transition into that athlete from just know your regular person into that. We like to have that. Um, we also like to use that when things go wrong in a um, competition. Like, so with the ball, you do something, you made some kind of error. Um, we want to have that routine again that you can just quickly do to refocus. People will say, I don't have time for that out on the, uh, the field, but you do because you're going to replay whatever mistake you made anyway. So if you can replace it with that routine right away. So routines are a big part of what we do. Um, but yeah, having that routine for your training too. And I think when you're doing these um, drills and things, implementing whatever it is your routine's gonna be, it's important. So you could do that, like whatever their whatever they're daily or week in the summer, mm -hmm. they could go through those three steps to get themselves kind of like in a mode. Of yes, ready, like I am this person, you know, it's like a different persona. Cool. Um, we're running out of time. We didn't get through all the questions, but um, I guess to wrap it up, um, maybe I'll let each of you go through. I know if you have any closing thoughts you want to share or suggestions. I just want to add one quick point to what he's just saying about how strength is important, but touching a ball every day for 30 minutes on a ball. I was on a podcast uh, two weeks ago, and I, they asked me my top five strength exercises for injury prevention. And actually, quick skills with a ball is one of my top strength exercises. So I. There's, there's so much hip stability. You know how that burns. That's right. Okay. There's so much hip stability and coordination and, and stuff that goes in with that. So touching a ball, you know, is necessary. You have to do that. And that, that, that was that was what you just for, you said that was for injury? I heard what you said. Yeah, well, they, they asked top five exercises that you can do to reduce the risk of injuries, lower extremity injuries and everything. And I was like, that's, it's got to be on the ball. You have to. That was actually one of the things that I, we didn't really get to was talking about. Because that was some of the questions we got from parents for me was, what are the things we can do in terms of injury prevention? Um, do you have so players, players, players get injured when things happen too fast for them to prepare their bodies or position their bodies effectively. So when you train at a slow rate all the time and then you get in against a faster team, you're going to get blown up. If you're not strong enough, if you're not quick enough with your feet, if you can't, if you're not aware enough. So all of these things factor in. So if you're training for that, there, there's got to be a speed of play involved into a speed of thought. There has to be a speed of reaction. 
uh, speed of movement. Do you have a good resource on your website to talk about that? If you email me, I will send you all of this. Yeah, he'll email you all you want. I'll give you everything you need. Okay. <laughs> do you have any clothing? Uh, yeah, I do here. Um, guys, this is just a game, you know, and we got to think. What, what are the messages that we're telling these kids? You know, that's, that's bigger than the game. I, uh, my dad always told me, Vahid, uh, my dad didn't think I would take the sport this far. He told me, Vahid, if the coach tells you finish over here, you don't finish here, you finish over here. Because when it's real life, you're gonna, when your back is against the wall, you'll finish short. That's the message I got from soccer, you know? And like I said, there's less than 1% that's gonna make it. So what are we teaching these kids? And I. I I think there's a technical strength part to it, but there's life lessons that I think as coaches, all of us have to realize sometimes, you know, who cares if we lose three nothing? Are my kids better kids because they see me every day? You know, that that's that's the bottom line. Because that's the one percent less are gonna make it pro or make a living out of it. So there has to be a bigger message. And then to those guys we share another message on top of this. Uh, so I can't we can't forget about that when we're coaching. With that. And I also wanted to go back to the parent issue real quick. Um, most parents want what's best for their kids, they just don't always know how to go about it. Um, so then we talked about working with the, um, not realizing if their kids can make it to the next level or not, but um, anyone can use the mental skills and they can use the mental skills in life too. So um, yes, I'm honest with parents about, about things, but always know that everybody can learn these mental skills and they're actually performance and life skills. Um, those. And on um, my website there, you can opt in for a free game, game day game changer guide, and it has all my top sports like tips um, that you can run off and give to teams. Does anybody have any questions that we didn't get to? Or? I have one last. So um, let's take the average 10 year old calendar year playing club soccer. Where do you guys fit into that calendar year? I, uh, I'll, I, uh, I see my kids once a week and uh, yearly. Uh, our small group sessions are yearly. Uh, some of them, because usually they'll practice twice a week with the club and then they'll have maybe one or two games if it's a tournament, four or five. And then once a week, the kids, <laughs> the, the kids will come once a week to us and we do technical work. Now some kids... So what's a typical, like, late in terms of weeks uh, to sign up for with you? Uh, you know, I tell kids, they when they say, I want to register at Mass, they say, give us at least eight weeks, you'll see improvement on your touch, at least. I mean, we're good at what we do, but I can't fix you in two sessions. I, it's impossible, you know, of So I give them eight weeks. Now, a lot of my kids, once they walk in my door, usually train with us year round, even when they're playing other sports, or even when club soccer starts, they're staying year round. Um, I have some kids that come during only winter, when it's one time a week. Right. You know, practice yeah, goes down from two times a week to one time a week. But I strongly tell parents, and I'm very honest, um, I said, guys, give us eight weeks, you know, because I can't perform magic if I don't. And you won't see much, you know. And even after eight weeks, you can't do it once weeks. a week. <laughs> I was going to say, you can't, I want you to do <laughs> Going once a week for eight weeks right. is, uh, you'll see improvement, but it's very minimal. Another thing is, how dedicated is that kid? Right. Some kids will go up and get, get the equipment we have and do it daily on their own. Mm -hmm. You know, it all comes back to consistency. And yeah. you, you can't just, I don't want anybody coming into my program thinking, this is a six week deal right. that I'm gonna do this summer and I'm gonna be better for the rest of the year. Yeah. Because right. that's unrealistic. It, whether they're doing it here or with the heat on their own, you know, it, it doesn't, with you guys, it, it just has to be consistent. And if they have that plan, they know what they're supposed to focus on, they know what they want to achieve by the end of it, then they need to be set on set in motion. There's tremendous value in what you all do, and I, you know, just kind of thinking, you know, that overzealous parent, hey, we're going to take you to a sports psychologist once a week, we're going to take you to a technique once a week, we're taking you to the the agility, the yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, so we have stream I think until ten thirty. So if you guys want to stick around and um, ask questions of the panel or just visit, then feel free to. Um,
again, thanks for everyone for coming. And if you if you got something out of it, make sure to share with other coaches. Um, we'd like to continue the success of these. Um, thanks for taking time out today to be here. And really a big thanks to the panel for thank you. Thank you. Can I get a picture you guys can